Recording is on. All right. Um, can can you hear me? Okay. Good. Yes. Perfect. Um, so uh, yeah. Well, I've. Um, it's been a very intense week. Uh, this this past one. Just got back to to Bogota from uh, Guayaquil in Ecuador. Uh, yesterday evening, um, yesterday I was kind of zombie uh, tired, and uh, after after a very intense week, the the event in, in Guayaquil went really really great. Um, it was um, it was a really special moment, uh, very emotional to be back on stage with Rodrigo and and kind of amplifying uh, what we the message we started at in the final table and having a big audience. We had over 800 people in the theater. Um, which is quite incredible, given that it's kind of a relatively small city in Ecuador. And uh, um, I mean, it's a big city, but uh, the second city of Ecuador, but then it's generally speaking, it's a, it's a medium sized city. So it was really incredible to have so many, so many people come out. And, um, and yeah, I guess that responds a bit uh, the question of Becca, who asked uh, <laughs> how, the, how the masterclass went. Um, it uh, it took a lot of a lot of effort um, because we were innovating in the format. Um, we were trying to um, basically combine what makes a TV show a TV show and uh, like a, you know something very exciting, stimulating, like never losing energy. Always a, a lot of things happening uh, together with cooking. Um, and a bit of improvisation as well, and a bit of humor, and um, and the presentation that was edited with uh, different videos that we had been editing for l last month. Uh, there's a cinematographer went to Las Tanusas to film the Rigo doing specific things after um, to reinforce the message uh, that we wanted to give, um, and um, and yeah, and it's been. Um, uh, so yeah, over a month of, of lots of work and writing as well, um, the course itself, uh, because um, let's say that um, we want to distill a little what the, um, what our philosophy is. And we found these three main kind of axes, um, these three main ways of, um, of thinking that we believe encompass all our philosophy, which are uh, creativity, um, biodiversity, and the future of food, and cosmovision, which is a, a concept borrowed from um, Latin American kind of um, ancient beliefs, um, cos the word cosmovision, but it's basically a belief system um, that connects the more um, historical aspects of identity and uh, uh, reconnecting with, uh, with ancient kind of knowledge, and, um, and also in a way some kind of, you know, spirituality approach to or at least a very personal but uh, um, an approach that is connected to a kind of sacredness of food you know in, in, so to speak whatever anyone understands by by sacred uh, the point being that there is something precious about it and uh, and so that's kind of one of the the, the, the elements that we wanted to to put forward um, and so I wanted to show you this because uh, I'm, I'm super excited that uh, I managed to, to, to save a few. I have like 12 of these. Um, weighed a lot in the bag. I got a few. So this is the booklet that we created um, for the event. And so uh, basically here we have a whole explanation of the final table Ecuador, what it was, what it meant. Um, it's in Spanish, um, but we should definitely translate it to English. Um, and uh, here's kind of I guess one of the best bios that I've managed to, to see of myself. It's really cool. And same for Rodrigo. Um, and the where we met in Boca Valdivia. This one is signed by Rodrigo. It says, please listen to nature more often. Uh, and I'm going to sign it too. And uh, might do some kind of giveaway with, with, uh, with here with patrons. So this is, I got this thinking of you. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll give away some through Instagram, um, but but mostly for, for patrons. And um, and yeah, so it was divided between different acts. 
This one is creativity. Um, I wrote three statements for creativity. This is my first statement, which is uh, art and science, a new renaissance uh, about culinary art being a total form of art. And then also the uh, culinary art being um, the identity or uh, the expression, more, the more sincere expression of, uh, of people. Uh, and uh, in terms of identity, here is Rodrigo and his three statements for creativity. Um, I'm not sure if you managed to read anyways, I'm just gonna show you the pictures. Then we talk about the diversity saying, um, I mentioned how cooking and eating are political acts. And that was kind of one of the main uh, takeaways. Uh, also that South America and in general the planet, but of course I was in Ecuador. So we, we talked about um, how South America is a, a cultural and natural treasure of, of the planet and it must be kept um, you know, as biodiverse as possible. And, and we need to, to make efforts to to, to, to keep nature beautiful and, and abundant. Um, um, and here kind of the, the, the planetary responsibility that we all have. And then the last act was Cosmovision. Uh, we did one dish that represented each of these um, live. And, uh, and the final plate, so we cooked uh, um, our, the, the plate that we, that we did uh, that we had designed for the finale of the final table. And it was the first time that we cooked it. Um, so yeah, these ones, um, they're signed by Rodrigo. I'll, I'll take care of signing them as well. And then I'll, I'll keep you posted to, um, to give away a few here for, for Patreon. Um, so that's how it went. Um, what else can I tell you about that? Um, the two weeks after, before that were a bit difficult for me. I had a lot going on uh, with this project and the project of uh, Barranquilla, which I'm leaving to Barranquilla in a couple of hours. Um, and that was taking a lot of my time and um, plus, I don't know why, like everything kind of condensed and email got crazy, WhatsApp got crazier and I was kind of just overwhelmed. Um, and it was a bit hard to, and I even kind of had to pause a little bit. Um, uh, wasn't feeling too, too, too good in my mind uh, and so, yeah, they had these in a few days that were a bit difficult. That's why I kind of uh, wasn't so present on Instagram and, and on Patreon, um, for which I kind of thank you for being patient um, on me. And um, and uh, and now it's kind of back back to to normal. Um, but I guess um, it connects to a bit of a um, quest for meaning, uh, internal quest for meaning, and, and for being more. Uh, connected with uh, what needs to be done, and uh, and this distance between what I want to do and what I know is the right thing to do, and what I can do today, um, with having a lot of opportunities, but it being very hard to to manage by myself. Um, so 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 it's a yeah, it's a journey, and it's going well. Definitely, lots of learnings recently, um, getting stronger. So so that's good. Um, so that that's the kind of sum up of the last three, four weeks uh, with this as a result and being very proud of what we did. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, we'll see. I, I haven't seen the, the official pictures of the behind the scenes of the event, but I know they didn't take pictures of the dishes and it breaks my heart. Um, I think there was too much going on. And uh, so I took some photos with my phone. I'll, 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 I'll post them uh, to you. I already posted uh, on, um, for those of you who are in the, yeah, follow me on Instagram and are part of my close friends group. I um, I posted the photo of my final plate there. Uh, it's a beautiful white plate. I don't know if it's here. I want to show it to you. Yeah. This is the plate that I had designed for the final table finale dish. They told us you can do whatever you want. So I asked them, I thought of my idea and the concept, and I really wanted the plate to look completely different. I didn't want the normal plate. Um, so I asked them to, to do a plexiglass dish. Um, that's around 32 centimeter, which is 32 centimeters is the standard size of, let's say, fine dining plates um, of the, the bigger one, the, the support plate sometimes in restaurants. It's a beautiful size, uh, but it's also amazing. It has incredible reflections. And, and shadows, so I played on top, and then you see the reflection, um, depending on the light that you put on, 
you see a reflection underneath. So you have kind of a 3D kind of visual representation. So this is the one I had designed for the final table. And I was very sad because when we left after France, um, I, was, like, I knew that this dish was made, like that there were 10 of them because we're supposed to cook for, for all the chefs. And, um, and, uh, and they were gone. I couldn't see it's like, well, one day I want to make it happen again. So this one was produced in Ecuador. Uh, and it's pretty amazing. Um, so I'm looking forward to do more things on this plate. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, enough about Guayaquil. There's uh, a few questions that I would love to respond. Uh, I have a list here uh, of questions that I got through Patreon and through Instagram. But before we continue and I go on the questions, I just wanted to give you the opportunity if you want to ask another question about what I just shared, whether it is of this specific uh, event, the plate, the, I don't know, if you want more info about what just happened in Guayaquil, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and share the question. Hello there. Anyone? No, nobody wants to share a question? I'll continue then. Right, okay, so um, next question. Oh, you want to say something, Eleonora? Yeah, can you no? hear me? Okay. Oh, you, you need to unmute yourself. I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? I can't unmute you, unfortunately. No. No, I think it's in the in the app. You need to press unmute. Uh, I can hear her. Otherwise, maybe unmute? you can write the question here in the chat. Opening the chat. Oh, you can hear. I can't hear her. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Um, oh, you can hear her, and I can't. That's weird. Everybody can hear me. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can't hear. That's funny. All right. Uh -huh. um, if you want to type in the question in the text, maybe I can respond it there. I'm sorry. This this maybe we can we can evolve this platform from this platform to another platform uh, for next time because it hasn't been working perfectly. It's weird that you guys can hear it and I, and I can hear her and I can't. All right. Um, to, what were the ingredients of the dish of the final plate? That's a good one. Um, so the, the whole idea of this final plate was that um, I wanted to represent a global dish. So uh, something that really represented um, the food on this planet. And um, if there is life somewhere else in the universe, it's going to have very different ingredients, right? It, it's going to be a completely different life form. And of course, thinking that there, there has to be liquid water in that planet somewhere else in the universe, um, and there has to be um, some, some kind of evolved life form, some kind of living system that captures um, the light of a star, of a nearby star, and transforms it into some kind of uh, stored form of energy, which is food. Um, and so it will be completely different. So if in the theoretical case of uh, us being able to interact with another species, if there is a, uh, you know, an alien civilization that arrives tomorrow, what, what do you feed them, right? How do, you, how do you give them something that represents what flavor on Earth is? Um, and so that's kind of the, the question, the hidden question, the hidden thought process of like, let's really think outside of the box here. And, and so I wanted to represent the four elements uh, and, the, and, and kind of, and also represent um, uh, the whole ecosystems of the planet. And so the, there were four main flavor elements in the dish, um, water, earth, um, air and fire. So there were four morsels of food that were represented with three or four different elements that tasted like the ocean, that tasted like the earth, that tasted like a, 
um, like the air, uh, or I were connected to air, and uh, and of course fire, spicy and, and and smoky. So, for instance, for the spicy uh, or the fire, uh, there was a bit of spiciness. There was also a bit of burnt, um, um, the the outer rim of uh, manioc that was burnt, so kind of an ash um, that was a bitter, but that really balanced out other flavors. There was. Um, uh, Achote anato, which is one of my favorite ingredients, um, very red, um, representing also visually the fire. And then there were, for example, for the ocean, I used, um, for each of these uh, flavors, I used only sustainable ingredients and future food ingredients. So there was, there was no beef, there was no uh, big animals or, uh, you know, animals that are on top of the food chain it was all sustainable, um, sustainably sourced ingredients. And that was really something important for me if I ever got to the final uh, in, in on, on, the, on the Netflix show, I wanted to just prove that you don't need luxury ingredients, you don't need expensive ingredients in order to create delicious flavor. So, um, for example, for the earth, it was all mushrooms, um, mushrooms, and there's a kind of a mushroom earth um, and two different types of mushrooms, um, a couple more elements on the, on the sea. Um, I, for, for the one on Friday, I used a tiny bit of um, the shrimp um, that is kind of sustainably farmed in, in Ecuador and uh, together with chlorella, which is an algae that is uh, probably one of the most incredible future foods uh, that is still not produced in masses. You find it as a supplement, uh, but it is incredibly nutritious and also has a very deep ocean flavor. Um, and then yeah, so that's kind of, uh, oh, for the air, I used, uh, I didn't want to use a bird. I wanted to use, although it was hard, kind of, I, I thought about it, you know, use something like foie gras or something like that at the beginning of the process. And I was like, no, I can't use a product that is unethically farmed or that is very kind of difficult um, in this process. So I went for uh, bees. And so there, the pollinators are one of the most essential life forms for life on earth uh, as we know it. And so I used lacto-fermented pollen, which is the food of the bees. Um, it is pollen that they uh, add an enzyme and creates kind of a, a very deep flavor, very intense flavor. Uh, it's called bee bread because that's a bit of the texture that it has. Uh, so I put bee bread, pollen and fruit, uh, fruit eventually, evidently being um, every fruit that you get to eat has been pollinated somehow. And we don't think about this, um, that there's an insect behind every fruit, right? So I put some fruit and then, and then the pollen um, made by the bees. So uh, of course, a very particular flavor, but if you've never eaten anything on earth and you come and eat this, it's gonna be a very special and also extremely nutritious experience. So that's kind of for, for, the, for the final plate. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm, I, need to, I need to do this dish again. Um, with professional photographer and really tell the whole story. Um, so that's gonna take me time and, and I have to dedicate some, but um, yeah, I am excited to, to share this with you and, um, and, and, and do a proper kind of writing all these things that I haven't written yet. Uh, it's only a draft and, um, and then also taking pictures uh, of, this, of this dish. Of course, this dish is a concept which means that if I do it in a different part of the world, it would have different ingredients um, um, because, you know, because of the local, I mean, it's a dish that would change depending on where it's made, but it would always have the four elements as represented in the local ecosystem uh, where I would be cooking. So yeah, it'd be very interesting to, to, to explore it further. Um, so that's it for that part. Uh, I'm gonna go um, if you have any questions, you can you can post them on the, on the chat. I'm gonna respond a few more questions. Um, um, Jalisha asked, um, I just recently realized that the big culinary industry kitchen lifestyle is not for me, but instead I want to travel and help communities through food by helping end world hunger. What was it like for you when you realized that you no longer wanted to work in an industry, big professional kitchen anymore? That's a really good one and, and, a, and a question that's close to my heart as, as I see us people 
that love food and that are interested in working with food professionally, uh, shifting from the mindset of food being only a profession that you can do in restaurants or in culinary art. It's, it's definitely the most attractive one. There's a lot of ways in which you can work with food, but um, and sometimes the, the things that work with food more in the industry level are not that connected, not that uh, not, not so exciting jobs, although there are incredibly exciting jobs in, in food technology, especially nowadays that things are changing. Um, so it's definitely a question that I care a lot about. Um, so I'm gonna first answer your last part, which is uh, what was it like when I realized that I no longer wanted to work in, in a big professional kitchen? Um, so I first thing was that it's really challenging um, to find sustainable sources of income. So I became a freelance chef. That was my decision. Um, and it was really important for me to be got, to start teaching. Um, and that changed a lot. That allowed me to learn more, uh, but um, to perfect my, my knowledge, basically, by teaching. But, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't, you know, I mean, uh, invest if I haven't if I had invested three years of my life in a big professional kitchen living the hard way in a way like really doing the hard work of learning about technique about production about um, discipline um, that you need uh, about the artistry and uh, and about the business model of the restaurant that made a huge difference for everything I've done since so even if it's something hard I would I would ask you like consider even if it's hard consider doing it anyways eventually because you can learn a lot it really depends on where you're going to do it of course um but the like the technique the culinary technique that the the day-to-day -day grind of processing food and it doesn't need to be in an expensive restaurant it can be in a very simple restaurant it can be in a canteen it can be but having that connection uh, i think is really important um for us as a base now um, there are so many ways of, 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 of going forward. And when you say you want to help travel and help communities through food by helping end world hunger, um, that is one of the first of the most important sustainable development goals proposed by the UN. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the sustainable development goals, but it is um, a document that, uh, or like a public policy basically, that all the countries that are part of the UN signed and in there, that means that um, that's gonna be a priority and there's gonna be funds for this. So there are NGOs, foundations that are working for this and that probably need people that know how to work and that sometimes it's volunteers, sometimes it's professionals. Um, I have a friend, for example, who's leading the efforts at the World Central Kitchen. He's traveling to all disaster zones or refugee crises and goes there and sets up a kitchen and makes food for 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people. That's an amazing job. And it's also a very complex one. Um, but um, like, I'm just thinking, like, how would you see, for example, working for World Central Kitchen? Have you reached out to them? Eventually, if they have some vacancy, eventually you can learn something, right? Um, so that's, that's a kind of thing that could be very interesting for you to explore more on the, on the on the foundations, getting into connection with, with people that are doing things um, to around world hunger. And there's so many ways of going through that. Like fighting food waste is a way to address world hunger, uh, for instance. Uh, and you can do that by working in a technology app that's trying to, um, uh, to, to, to solve the problem. So there's many ways of going through it. Um, and I think it's just kind of, right now the first advice would be just expand your curiosity and see the type of uh, organizations that are doing work in which you would like to 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 work and uh, and and try to see what what is the skill that they need and try to see how you can learn that skill in order to to eventually one day get there. But if you put yourself uh, the goal, you'll probably get there for sure. Um, right. Um, next question. Um, Lucas, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on how you recharge your passions and invigorate your creativity. What helps you keep motivated to maintain and build momentum against life's challenges? That's a, that's a good one. Um, and I could, I could um, talk about it, you know, 
a full hour conversation on this. It's a, it's a very big thing. There's a lot that goes in there, um, you know, work, life balance, uh, mental health, um, uh, physical health. Um, and, and I think what happened to me three weeks ago is, um, so you always think about physical health and, you know, you do, you, you do sports or you go running or something and you care for that. But in the same way that we do that, sometimes we forget that mental health is not something that is kind of a disease that just happens. No, sometimes you just get sick, right? And for a week you have mental flu. Um, that's what I kind of had the other day because I wasn't really taking the time to do yoga, which is a practice that when, when done well, uh, or meditation, when done well, it allows you to take a distance from yourself. It allows you to, to be healthy, to feel good, of course, and that's the first base. But then also just to, to be able to center yourself with who you are and, and to take a distance. Just like, this is not, you know, I have this challenge. It's not happening to me. It's, it's, it's just something that is there. And I can really be, get personal with that challenge and suffer from it. Or I can just see it as something that is external to me and that I can control and that I can work through. Right, so I think that that part of mental health of, of you know, and and the first and foremost would be meditation, um, and and yoga that I would say are are really good to to help through that. But then there's so many things, right? Community, um, being close to friends and and creating spaces for dialogue and for exchange around a good meal. Um, that's definitely a place to recharge. Nature, just going away for three days and staring out of the horizon in some beautiful landscape. Um, that is also a way of recharging um, because it is the, true that keeping motivation and, 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 and build momentum is, I would say that it's not something that we're geared to be doing 100% of the time. Um, you know, there's, there's summer and then there's autumn and then there's winter and then there's spring and then there's summer again, right? So we live in cycles and I think we're kind of disconnected from that. Uh, so we can't be 100% all the time. Uh, and I thought I was one of the people that thought it was possible, but um, it's not. And so that's why I, I, I mentioned just kind of um, also surrounding yourself with people that, that, that allow you, that give you that space and that are just there for you whenever you need. But um, so yeah, community, um, meditation, um, good health and good food and, um, and just also giving ourselves space uh, to, 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 to be not at 100% all the time, uh, not put a, un, unnecessary pressure on ourselves. I think that's kind of my, my take on that. But I would say that maybe a year ago, I thought I had that, you know, pretty well controlled in my life. Um, and I hadn't, and may, and now and maybe I look like I do, but I don't, it's, it's a, it's a whole life uh, kind of process and, and we change, um, so yeah, the seasonality in life bursts, that's it, right? Sometimes things are ready to come to fruition. Sometimes ideas need months of gestation and they go slowly and you know, it never pops in from zero to a hundred immediately. Um, but yeah, and the important bit being enjoying the ride. Uh, and even when we're not on top of our mountain, just enjoying the fact that we're feeling all these things. It's, it's great, it's life, that's life. Um, Right, so another question. Um, right, wow, there's so many good ones. Um, so there's, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. That was a question from Instagram. Um, Ariel um, asked, do you have sustainability tips for people who eat out a lot? Yes, it's been a big, a big question for me because since I travel so much and I do care about my personal impact, um, I one of the big things is is starting small and doing kind of um, trying to do something. It's hard to be perfect um, nowadays um, because the the offer around is only just kind of starting to change. Uh, towards more sustainable. It really depends also on, how, on where you live. Some places are kind of food deserts when you only have any certain type of, uh, of foods that are not necessarily good for you and you need to go very far away to really get fresh food. So complicated, depends on the places, but I would say that 
um, first thing that comes to my mind when I go to a place is really trying to avoid single use packaging, um, sec plastic wrappings and all that. So that's kind of my first thing. If something I crave is in a little kind of plastic thing and it might be the organic salad, um, I, don't, I don't go for that one. Um, and so trying to always use the things that are either fresh and unwrapped. So that's one, one criteria. And then, and then of course, eating, um, eating, choosing the uh, vegan or vegetarian options um, first. Uh, I, I do enjoy meat, I do enjoy fish, but I try to make it only when I know that, the, that there's some kind of ethical um, proximity and uh, that I can trace, understand where that animal is from. And I only do that once or twice a week. If you, all, if you already are, for example, vegetarian or vegan, uh, you would be, of course, it's harder because there are some places that don't have those options. Uh, you can also, you can always ask, and, and people in the industry know it already. It's, it's really changing. So uh, there are more kind of sustainable options, uh, vegetarian options happening in, in menus. So it is slowly changing. Um, but I, I think that that together with the, the packaging and reducing, is, is, is essential. And then the other one is knowing how to control our desires because it is a natural instinct of humans to order more than what we need um, because from an evolutionary perspective, every time we had food, we would take as much as we could because we wouldn't know if tomorrow we would have the same amount of food. We're talking about pre-technological eras. We're talking about not so far away, actually, 150 years ago. People had not did not have the abundance, but we're still wired. Our senses, our, our brains are still wired. When we see food, we get more than we can eat. So that produces a lot of waste. And that's, uh, that's an important thing. So being aware of our consumptions um, and not wasting because 40% of the food that is wasted happens in households, for instance, uh, both in, the, in our refrigerators and on our plates, put too much on the plate um, or order too much in restaurants. Um, so that's kind of what some some ideas. Um, so um, Lif Liftody asked on Instagram too. I think, um, are you planning on doing more live events? Yes, I'd love that, uh, but it's not easy. It's um, so February in Bogota, March in Calgary, uh, last month or oh, well this month actually uh, Guayaquil. Um, Next month, uh, I'm going to do one in, in, in Los Angeles, collaboration with Team Hollingsworth. Um, but it is sometimes hard. I was thinking I want to do something in Mexico. But production, marketing, you know, there's, there's a bunch of things. And if you want to have more than just a very simple thing that can only host a very small amount of people, which is kind of polemic because just, you know, if I went to Mexico and I did something for 10 people, Yes, it's kind of public, but you know it's not really the scale. Um, so, kind of a bit, kind of waiting for more people to propose, not to just ask me, "Hey, why don't you come to this place?" But actually, "Hey, I'm, I can organize an event for you." Um, you know, I take care of finding a sponsor to, to cover your flights, and then finding a place, and then help you connect with local media so you make a little bit of noise. And so, I'm kind of. That uh, I thought at some point that I would be the one organizing and leading this, but I realized was driving me crazy and kind of not allowing me to have time and space for myself and for being creative, right? So, um, so I I kind of regret not having more time because I know how to produce these events. I've, I've produced events for three hundred people. Um, I've produced big events, but um, I. I, I can't be producer and actor at the same time. So if I really want to be the one kind of performing and sharing a message, I need people who help me um, producing this event. So right now I'm kind of waiting a little bit. Um, so for instance, I'm going to, to New Zealand. That's gonna be a public event, collaborate with Monique. Um, I'm super excited about that. Then in June, uh, so that's in June, right? Uh, uh, and then July, August, I'm still not sure. Um, so I'm not even sure where I'm going to be on the planet, but I would love to go to places like Mexico, of course, Philippines. Um, um, I don't know. Um, I would love to 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 India. I've also received some some invitations, but then 
um, yeah, I would love uh, I'd love to see how that manifests in the coming months and years. Um, right, another questions. Um, so Bekas Tanozek, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, asked me what I think about coffee and caffeine. Uh, there's so many drugs in food. Caffeine, caffeine is a drug. It's a, it's a, it's a psychoactive element it changes your metabolism it changes your perceptions it really affects your nervous system and that's great um, we have a, a broad array of substances that uh, get us high in a way and that helps us help us go through the day and affect our mood um, so I personally enjoy uh, that but it, it really requires wisdom because if you have too much coffee you start shaking you're not able to or if you, you know, you do alcohol um, is another psychoactive, um, you know, but you need to, you need to know yourself and you have different, everyone has a different perception to this. Some people can't stand uh, mate, for instance, because it's too high in caffeine. Some others can't operate, they don't have it. There's a lot of habit in that, um, but everything that we consume has some kind of effect on our mood. And just so kind of educating ourselves on what, what the effects are, are very good. There's so many, super interesting podcasts out there uh, that are around food and, and how they affect our performance, our cognitive performance, our physical performance, um, and, and, and also even uh, on aging. There's a lot of effects of these substances on aging. Um, so one thing, what I think, I love coffee. Uh, I try not to drink it too much uh, or every day even, um, but it is definitely one of the pleasures. And, uh, yeah, and as, as everything else, you know, needs to be consumed in moderation. That's uh, that's important. Um, um, May Balini asked, "What's my comfort dish?" Comfort dish is probably um, a Colombian soup. Well, actually, Colombian soups in general, um, but one of them is called changua. I actually did one, cooked one the other day in France, and I took videos of me preparing and explaining it. Uh, I haven't published it because, because I don't know, sometimes, and it's something that I wanted to share with you, and uh, I sometimes feel myself doing things and explaining things and recipes and processes and all that, but I, I find the content is not good enough and I end up not posting it. So one day eventually I will be able to work with content creators that can help me and make it look very nice and, 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 and make it easy, but sometimes I just kind of don't, don't think that it's good enough um, to, to show. So uh, yeah, I might uh, I might need your help eventually to try to figure out a format or way things that could work. So right now, at the behind the scenes is, is one of the places where I feel more comfortable sharing things, even if they're not perfect. Um, so so we'll, we'll see there, but yeah, that soup, um, changua, which is made with onion, milk and egg, that's it, and, and coriander. It's a very simple soup. Uh, it's kind of a, a poor man's soup here in, in Colombia. Uh, it's kind of you, you you put a little milk in water, put onion, uh, coriander, boil it. The aromas are, are, are really special. And then you poach an egg inside and put some uh, old bread. And it's, it's, it's amazing. And then and there's also another soup in Colombia that's called ajiaco. My mother prefers that to me every time I, I come back to Colombia. It's uh, three types of potatoes. Uh, peas and guascas, which is a, a wild herb from, from these parts of the Andes. And that's also an amazing, so I think soup in general, really. Soup is the comfort. Um, the very definition of comforting food, right? It's just when you can take something in your home to pour it inside of you. <laughs> um, so what other questions do we have here? If you can think about any other one, Please feel free to write on the on the, on the text here in the chat. Um, what uh, so Tibak Tess asked? What are your thoughts on sugar? What's the alternative? Well, sugar is life's energy. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, we evolved to. We evolved taste buds that give 
pleasure signals in the brain when we taste sweetness because our body needs it. Like if we're able to be conscious right now and be aware and be able to move our bodies it's because we have the energy in our bodies that was brought in by sugars and fats, but sugars are the core of it, uh, glucose. So it's fundamental for life, right? That's what I think about it. And we're kind of demonizing sugar. Oh, sugar is bad or salt is bad. Yes, if you have too much of it. If you don't, it's absolutely fundamental for your, your body and your health. So that's the first thing I think about it, um, that it's a, a, a treasure, right? Um, a hundred years ago even, uh, but in the past, like a human would find a hive and be able to steal some honey from, from, the, from the hive and it would be like the most delicious thing, the most precious food you could find would be wild honey because it is pure sugar and you don't find pure sugar often in nature. Think about it. Um, you can distill it. Modern, in modern days, you can extract sugar from beetroot, which is what I would say, yes, avoid white sugar. Avoid white sugar, uh, just like avoid white salt, right? There, is, there are ingredients that are salty by nature. Uh, and you can get uh, an umami, for instance. Um, so if you put mushrooms in a recipe, you're adding umami. And that umami has that salt component. It has a sodium in it. So uh, you can give seasoning or can enhance the flavor of something by using natural salts included in the foods. For example, you use a bit of anchovies, one or two anchovies in your pasta or in your soup. It will give you the amount of umami necessary. You don't need to add any salt. So I would say try to avoid the, the, the pure forms, the white sugar, the white salt, and try to find that salt elsewhere. I think that's the most natural uh, way. Um, so definitely, um, definitely something essential to, to reframe our relationship to these ingredients because they're fundamental to life and we're trying to create a war on them and we don't really understand what's up. Um, Roli, hey Roli, um, good to see you here. What's on your opinion of, of Japanese knives? What kind of knives do you prefer? Absolutely, Japanese knives are, uh, yeah, they're like the Rolls Royce of knives um, for the simple reason that the metal um, that Japanese use traditionally uh, is very hard and the techniques that uh, they've developed over millennia to make that metal harder and to, to keep like, um, so for those of you who don't know, Japanese knives also have a very particular um, angle at the, at the tip that makes it very sharp, but the only way you can keep that is by sharpening with stones, with whetstones. And whetstones sharpening is a technique that you have to learn just like anything else. And it will take you weeks or months to be good at it. Uh, and you might ruin a knife in the process, uh, but that's what you should do if you really want to get into good knives, into the best knives. It's an investment, but then it's your tool. It's something that I still have my original knife from uh, 2008. Um, it used to be this long, but now it's probably this long and it used to be this thick and now it's probably this thick, but it's still sharp going strong and, and being sharpened. And, you know, it's a tool for life uh, if you use it well. So um, it's worth the investment. Sometimes these knives are more expensive, but if you keep it close to you and it becomes a, it, it also, I think it sharpens your philosophy to really have a good knife. So that's what I think about knives. <laughs> and, um, and definitely... Um, yeah, my favorite are um, Japanese, and uh, I had the chance to go to Japan to buy them there from the artisan, uh, and that's another level, also, of, co of course, because you you save on the knife. Of course, you need to go there, but you save on the knife, and you know that it's something that that is just uh, very, very well done. Um, Lucas asked another question: um, Do you feel we're reaching a tipping point in sustainable food innovation? How would you suggest helping to reinforce that movement? For example, uh, popularity of the impossible food or impossible burger, which is uh, animal-free meat, and the edible sea seaweed uh, water capsules in the upcoming London Marathon. Oh, it's, oh, I haven't heard about these edible seaweed water capsules. That's interesting. Um, I'd love to read about that more. If you have a link, Lucas, it would be cool to, to read. Um, I think we're reaching a tipping point 
for sure. Um, what we can, what can we do to reinforce that movement? Support and buy and consume, I think, and talk about it and cook with it and find ways of also making these brands improve because some of them have the product, but they don't have the marketing. Some of them have the marketing, but they have a horrible packaging with three layers of plastic. Um, so we can work as consumers. We have with our money, it's kind of a vote. We vote for this particular business or this other business or this industry, uh, this way of making things. And we also, they want to hear about us, right? Big companies pay a lot of money to get market insights. The market insights, you can also just give it to them by tweeting, by tagging them on Instagram, by, you know, like, and, and I think we need to be closer to these companies that are doing things well um and, and supporting and there's definitely a tipping point in the sense that uh, there's a lot of innovation you see a lot of startups but they need our support and also um just like it's happening it happened with organic that it became industrial very quickly and yes it is organic it is cleaner but it is not it's far away from sustainable still um especially in the us because big um agro took over the, the the idea of organic so uh, and it's not that sustainable anymore um, just like it's happening right now for example in california they've legalized hemp and um, the small farmers are like we need to organize ourselves in a way that this does not become uh, like a philip morris type of corporation um, you know we want to keep it small we want to keep it local and so all that is very important it takes a big role um, sean asking what's your take on street food i feel like it's a battle between protecting traditions and sustainability of environment for example street hawkers are selling cheap food and in order for them to strive they will try to industrialize or cheap ingredients that isn't supporting the environment that's really good i think there's different i mean when we say street food what do you exactly mean right because a restaurant is also something that you get in the streets right so what to what point um, a street food is uh, a street food. Oh, I think my camera. Oh, my camera stopped working, but hopefully you can still hear me. Um, and so um, I think there is also traditions that uh, are better than others. Uh, if you go to traditions that are a thousand years old, they will be sustainable by design. If you have a tradition that was created 50 years ago after the war, um, or, you know, for example, we're just discussing this with, um, uh, I think it was with Andy, um, who's also a patron, I'm not sure if she's here, uh, about uh, street food in Thailand or kind of the, the food in Thailand that the traditional there has been shaped by tourism and by a tourism that doesn't know what Thai food is. but they think that Thai food is just Pad Thai and they go there and, and people end up giving them what people buy. So uh, without connecting with their traditions, right? And if the public, the tourists uh, think because there is a market for that in a big city in the, in the US or somewhere else, uh, and people think that Pad Thai must have meat and then so they, people in, in the country will say, well, this is what the public wants, so this is what we're going to do, and 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 the, and the traditions ends up being uh, lost a little bit. So I think connecting with the uh, true identity of of people and, and making them realize the the value of their own um, traditions and history is the way forward in order to really go towards authentic, real street food. Like how traditional is it? For example, in Colombia here. Um, there's a lot of uh, fried pork on the menu uh, in street food and fried pork wasn't around, wasn't a thing 500 years ago. So it is not a native tradition, it's something that was brought in by uh, probably Europeans who had a much more pork rich diet, right? So it's, it's uh, uh, I think that the further in the past you look, the more you will connect with sustainable um for a particular ecosystem um, and so that's kind of um that's kind of the way but again even there just asking and and sometimes you know delicious doesn't mean good 
for the environment. But then when you really hit the mark uh, and find the right spot, you have both delicious and meaningful and sustainable. Um, that's for me is real delicious is when there's a component of, uh, of the, uh, a certain beauty in the process, not only a certain beauty in, in, in the flavor. Uh, Isa Carolina says that here in the uh, Dominican Republic, you find hot dogs and burgers on street food, and that's not native like you, Carpentines, exactly. Hot dogs and burgers are a form of colonization um, that we still haven't gone beyond, right? I think that decolonizing culture is fundamental for this. And by decolonizing, I'm, I'm talking about identity. I'm not talking about techniques. There are techniques that we improve each other when we share across the world, right? Um, like if everybody knew or more countries knew how good plantain leaves are to cook, to preserve food, to use as plates, it's an incredible technology and that could be served anywhere, right? And so um, so that's, that's kind of, I think the, and that was one of the main points actually, um, unfortunately my camera is not working, but yeah, one of the main points that we had um, on the final table in Ecuador uh, last Friday was uh, the importance of decolonizing um, culture. And this is something that I would say everywhere, um, even, even in, a, in, a, in an old world, well, in a, in a country like France or, or the UK, I would say that that, that is important um, because uh, there is a sense that, um, that uh, we need to really connect with, with what's ancient in a particular land. We need to connect to the land in the end. Um, right, so let's do one final question and then I need to run to the airport. Um, I hope that what I've been sharing has been interesting. Oh, there's Andy. Uh, hello. Um, so she says, I'm curious to know if you feel like there is an effect on our notions or opinions of what we are eating simply based on the environment we're eating them in. What is your perspective on the interior of the space you're eating for sure? Wow, so I, this is, I could go into, into a few examples uh, um, that illustrate the importance of what you're just pointing out there. Mm. So first of all, food is always a multi-sensory experience. That's kind of the, the big part of the research that I was doing at Oxford is showing just how much sounds, atmospherics, expectations, comfort, colors, um, uh, lighting, temperature, all these things play a role in how you will perceive your food. Uh, so food is kind of a unified multi-sensory experience and one that the brain really puts a lot of resource and a lot of parts of the brain integrate in order to generate our perceptions. So we're in a way always eating the atmosphere on which we're eating. It's never only about the food. So, um, uh, and uh, so yes, the answer is absolutely yes. Now there's different types of effects. There are effects uh, like cultural effects. Uh, so for example, listening to French music while eating a Mexican taco will make the taco taste a little bit less authentic, even if you don't realize that you're listening to French music in the background. Just like con putting this, a congruent stimuli, like Mexican music, um, or even just music in Spanish when you're eating a taco, it's going to be like, mm, this is a, an authentic taco. So if you ask people in an experiment uh, on, on, on a scale of one to 10, how authentic the taco is, it will change depending on the music. So, and, and you don't know that, you don't realize it consciously, it's just happening to you. So there's definitely a huge one. Um, and then uh, the perspective on interior of, of the space you're eating, I think the more we connect with the farm, with the source uh, of where we're kind of feeding people, uh, the the better the experience will be. Um, so, um, I yeah, when we create, it's not only a plate; it's it's an experience of of, of a food. And uh, and the, for me, the best experience is always when I'm able to to reach out uh, and and grab a fresh vegetable from the earth and and, and you know and and have that real connection, which is also uh, in terms of uh, space you're eating, right? The proximity of the ingredients, that's the true luxury. Um, and uh, 
but then yeah i could speak about four hours about that um and i would love to, to speak a bit more with you later andy um on the mentorship right um so i hope i hope this was um good for you all uh thank you so much for for um for showing up i'm really curious also to to hear more uh, of your questions, your feedback. I'll try as much. Now that I got over with uh, Guayaquil, I'm going to go to Barranquilla. I have a big kind of uh, work piece that I'm doing there until Saturday. And after that, I'll be much more available to respond to your questions. I'm going to have to connect back on Slack. Uh, I saw that there's a bit of activity there, and I would love to, to, to get back to it. So after this, I'm going to have much more time in May, which I'm very looking forward to. And uh, but yeah, really listening to you and and reading all your messages. So uh, again, thank you all so much for the support. Uh, I hope uh, this one is actually recorded and I can upload it somewhere so other patrons can see it. Uh, I see some smiles around. Thank you all so much. <laughs> it's cool, and I'm I'm really happy to be able to have this this platform to to connect with y'all. Um, so yeah, my my video is not working, but. Um, have a big smile and, and my both my hands up, thanking you uh, <laughs> for 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 being here and showing up and supporting. Uh, thank you, Rolly. Have a great day too. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> See you soon. Bye bye.